Hello and welcome to Conversations at Noon for the Connecticut Freedom Trail. I'm Andre Kitt, sitting in for my friend Tammy Denise, who is the Outreach Director for Connecticut Freedom Trail, who's a little under the weather today. But not to worry, we have a really nice conversation set up for you today. But first, I want to do some housekeeping. In 1995, the General Assembly established the Connecticut Freedom Trail as a way to recognize African Americans and other uh, marginalized populations they, to fight for freedom and social equity in Connecticut and to mark the sites that bore witness to stories uh, that fight for freedom. Today, the Connecticut Freedom Trail includes over 170 sites and growing. The conversations at noon on the Connecticut Freedom Trail program series happening every fourth Tuesday of this month highlights each of those sites and the research that is available to us all. Hope you enjoy our show today. We have a very, very special guest. We have Mr. Kevin Johnson with us. He portrays a private web among other wonderful things, storytelling that he does. Kevin Johnson is an employee of the State Library's History and Genealogy Unit. He's been presenting William Webb for more than 20 years and has given more than 600 presentations. The Connecticut State Library provides high quality library and information services to state government and the citizens of Connecticut. It also preserves and makes accessible the records of Connecticut's history and heritage. Now, the focus of the museum and its collection is Connecticut's government, military, and industrial history. Permanent and changing exhibits trace the growth of the state, its role in the development of the nation from the colonial era, era to the present. So. Just hold on a few seconds before we have our guest for the day as we watch a little bit about him. My name is Kevin Johnson of Tanker State Library. I uh, work as a library technical assistant at the H&G Unit, History Genealogy Unit. Uh, genealogy is uh, tracing your family history, uh, looking up your lineage, uh, what I always like to call it is finding your family roots. Knowing where you come from, uh, I think is vitally important. Knowing the contributions uh, that your ancestors may have contributed to a war or to some part of society that made it a better world. Uh, so when we tap into that and realize who we are, uh, you kind of hold, sit up straight and hold your shoulders back, you know, and you carry a little bit more pride. Talking to my grandmother, uh, who lived to be 96 years old, she shared a great deal of my family history with me. And she would tell me about coming uh, through the early 1900s and talking to her grandparents about coming through slavery. Uh, so many of those stories pulled me uh, and intrigued me uh, into wanting to know more and then to be able to share it uh, with passion, uh, to bring it to life, to let people know uh, African-Americans really wanted to be free and was willing to do all of the things that was necessary. The first step would actually uh, is talk to your family. Uh, talk to those seniors that are, are still alive and gather as much information that you can uh, about your own family history, starting with yourself and beginning to work backwards. Uh, for African-American history uh, becomes a, a great stumbling block because, you know, being uh, brought as captives uh, to the nation, to America, the history isn't fully there. And the documentation from the owners uh, definitely didn't leave great detailed records but there are sometimes you can find some things, but just a matter of knowing where to look, uh, being held or found into the land deeds uh, as property uh, is one of those sources to be able to just search for African-American uh, history. Uh, but if you're unaware of those things, you won't know where to really begin, where to search, what documents to look for. I don't think the public is aware of all of the resources we have going from vital records, uh, land records, uh, court documents, uh, from the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, probate dockets, um, uh, published material, uh, wills, 
So we have a variety of resources, also some uh, guides helping people to understand how to do family genealogy. The more you know, the more our staff is able to help you. Find your niche uh, and then try to see if you can link it to an ancestor. These are real people who lived in a real time with real issues. Uh, and some of those issues we still uh, deal with today. Many times we look at history so general, you know, as something that's just in a book, you know, that someone wrote about. Uh, but if we, until we could connect with it and make it make sense and make it real, uh, it becomes alive. Set on free, praise the Lord, I'm free, I'm no longer bound, there's no more chains holding me, and my soul is resting, and it's such a blessing to praise the Lord. Hallelujah, I'm free. Freedom said it sounds good and it sounds nice. Got to be free. Greetings to all of you. My name is Private William Riley Salisbury Webb of the 29th Connecticut Volunteers and I fought in the Civil War. Now that old song that you heard me come in on was what our fight was all about. An opportunity and a chance at freedom. When I think back until the time of enlistment, I can still hear Sergeant Alexander Newton say, I enlist unto this conflict until the clanking of slave chains shall be heard no more. Listen, there's no more clanking. There's no more slave chains. Said I'm free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. Freedom. Said it sounds good and it sounds nice. Got to be free. Now, before I begin to tell you our story, I always like to stop and give thanks and honor to all of those who have fought and died for our freedom. I think back unto the year 1828. There was a young slave by the name of Nat Turner who had desired to be free. All Nat ever wanted was one day to be free. So he had this vision. And in this vision, said if slavery was going to be abolished, somebody had to die and blood had to be shed. So Nat Turner gathered 59 men and one woman, and they tried to overthrow slavery in the South, but he was later captured and he was hanged. Then in 1859, a white gentleman from Torrington, Connecticut, a Mr. John Brown took up the same vision that Nat had. And John Brown tried to overthrow slavery, but he was also captured and he was hanged. Then in 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and blacks everywhere were set free. And I say to you again, freedom said it sounds good and it sounds nice. Got to be free. Now, I was born in the year 1834. My mother's name was Eloisa Johnson and my dad I did not know. But I always wondered who dad was. Was dad a tall man? Was he strong or friendly or kind? But I never had an opportunity to meet him. But in 1840, my mother, she met and she married a Mr. Edwin Salisbury of Ellington, Connecticut. Now, Mr. Salisbury was a good man. He owned a nice piece of land and he taught me all those things that a young man needed to know. Taught me respect and honor, but most of all, how to work with my hands. See, he was everything to me. He was my friend. He was my big brother. Thanks, Dad. But in 1855, I disappointed Dad, and I committed a crime. And I was sent to the Wethersfield State Prison, where I spent four years of my life. That old song you just heard me sing about freedom, I just gave it all back. But during that time, it was rumored that war was getting ready to start in our country, the North versus the South. 1861, war started, the North versus the South. Now, Blacks weren't allowed to fight, not until 1862, when Congress passed an act allowing for the enlistment of colored soldiers. Then in 1863, the War Department had established the Bureau of Colored Soldiers. 
Now, there was nearly 200,000 black soldiers who fought during the Civil War, comprised of 60 artillery, infantry, engineer, and cavalry units. There was at least 100 black officers. But you see, I wasn't an officer, so I was just a private. I was one of those little small guys, you see. But man, we served with this gentleman from Middletown. Sergeant Alfred Powers, who stood about six foot four, 245 pounds. See, Sergeant Powers was a big man. And we would all gather around our encampment and we would play cards and sing songs and drink our coffee and eat our hard that. Then Sergeant Powers, he would quietly creep up on the scene and all the soldiers start going, here comes Sergeant Powers, here comes Sergeant Powers, did hunt. See, seeing Sergeant Powers gave us that sense of hope that if a black man could be an officer in the United States Army at that time, then anything was possible with freedom. Anything you wanted to be, you could be with freedom. But it also reminds us of the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass said to our men before we marched in the war. Frederick Douglass said, once let the black man get upon his person, the brass letters U.S., and an eagle on his button, and a musket on his shoulder, and bullets in his pocket. There is no power on earth that can deny that the black man has not earned the right to be a citizen in the United States. Freedom said it sounds good and it sounds nice. Got to be free. Thank you. That's just my brief introduction of my story of Private William Riley Salisbury Webb, one of those gentlemen from the 29th Tenth Volunteers who I have shared that story now for now some. 26 years. And every time I get an opportunity to share that story, it always puts a smile in my heart, also brings tears to my eyes, just looking at the journey of these men who were willing to die for this thing called freedom. And so I'm so grateful to be here uh, and to share with you in this moment and just to talk a little bit about the experience and the research and the process of just digging out all this information about the 29th Connecticut Volunteers. And so I'm so glad to be here. Sorry my friend, Miss Tammy, was under the weather, but it's good to see Brother Andre, who's here with us. And I'm so grateful to uh, this opportunity to be able to share. But Brother Andre, so good to see you, sir. And to everyone who's there watching, uh, it's just a great opportunity uh, to be here and to talk about private web and the research. First, let me start off by giving you a round of applause. Ah, I was able to enjoy that once again. I'm so glad that our listeners and viewers are able to sit back and listen to you revel in private web once again. I heard you say you've been doing it for 26 years. Pretty bit, pretty, pretty much of a long time. I met you, what, 20 years ago? <laughs> so... My first question is, the I guess the rumors of your retirement are um, just uh, out there and not true or something? Because here you are. <laughs> uh, yes, um, the, the rumors are not me retiring from the agency. I still got a couple of more years uh, to actually work here at the State Library uh, in the History of Genealogy Unit, as you saw in that clip. Uh, but definitely, this is the season of retiring Private William Webb. Uh, of 26 years of a journey. Got started all the way back in 1998. Uh, we were asked by the Bushnell Foundation to do something to honor the Black soldiers for the Freedom Trail. And so we were asked to participate. And so our museum director, who is now retired, uh, Mr. Dean Nelson, comes over to me one day at work and he says, hey, Kev, how would you like to become Denzel Washington for a moment? And so he asked me to become Denzel. And to put on a uniform like Denzel did in the movie Glory. And so we did. I put on that uniform and uh, they're sharing with uh, uh, the people who were passerbyers during that moment. And as we were sharing there, a young man from Yukon uh, saw me presenting and, and just dressed in his uniform and began to just kind of ask questions. Said, man, you look like one of the Buffalo soldiers. And so I told him, I said, no, not one of the Buffalo soldiers, but as you know, the Buffalo soldiers, those black soldiers that actually stayed in the army after the Civil War, went out west down in Texas, made a great name for themselves. They're not one of the Buffalo soldiers. He says, you sure you're not Denzel? I'm like, no, I'm not Denzel, I'm not Denzel. But as you know, the 54th was that great African-American regiment out of Massachusetts. 
that made their great stand at Fort Wagner and started talking about the 54. But he said, well, Kev, can you come to the university and just kind of share a little bit about why you dress like this and talk about Connecticut soldiers. And as you know, Connecticut soldiers, uh, Connecticut enlisted uh, two regiments, the 29th and the 30th. The 30th didn't raise enough Civil War soldiers. So those guys, they put in the 30th, they actually enlisted them and moved them to the United States Colored Troop, the 31st Regiment, and they went right into action. And our guys were still being recruited and ready to uh, train and be prepared for going into duty. Uh, but that date was February 10th of 1998. Had absolutely no idea. Here it is 26 years later uh, sharing the story. And so as the question was raised, uh, I, I believe it's time. And so what our aim was way back then was to really bring awareness uh, to the 29th and not knowing that it was going to pull me. And I remember that date. And when I took that date, I remember Dean saying and whispered in my ear, says, Kev, once you tell one Civil War story, you will never stop telling the story. And Brother Andre, that date was February 10th of 1998, 674 presentations later. So I think Dean was right uh, in sharing that uh, about that piece. And so uh, this has truly been a journey for me. Uh, this story has taken me all across our state and to many of our libraries, schools, uh, museums, churches, uh, institutions, even going into some of our correctional institutions and just sharing, had the great privilege of also standing on that great stage in Tanglewood uh, in a program of Salute to America and sharing a part of this 29th great story. So it's been a great run, a great journey. I uh, definitely uh, not tired of doing the character because it brings me so much joy to be able to share, but it is time to move to, to some other ventures. And Connecticut has so many great stories. And so I did find one, which I'll share with you a little bit later. Uh, so Kevin, you, you've, uh, answered, you've answered like 10 of the questions I had already. <laughs> and I'm glad that you've done it because I didn't want to interrupt your, your storytelling as you even imparted the background of what you've been doing. You've got a well-oiled, fine-tuned, piece that you've been doing this 26 years. Can you talk to me about your approach in doing a private web? Did you read letters? What, how did you pull this all together to be, up, to be able to put it together and stand up and, and um, present this really great historical presentation? Wow. Both, both you know, your uh, historical um, uh, outfit plus you, the research you've done. Can you talk to me about that process? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that, that was truly a process, um, not knowing uh, who Private Web was. And so our first thought was, uh, before going into the University of Connecticut and talking, had to do some research. Uh, so came back here to the Connecticut State Library, uh, that great institution located at 231 Capitol Avenue, uh, Hartford, Connecticut, right across from your state capitol, uh, came back to the library. I began to dive into the primary records, uh, began to look at some of our enlistment papers and the finger stopped on private web and had to figure out who was he. So what we did was basically, and I say we, because it was a collective effort of many of my colleagues looking at the pieces here and there, but pulling together information about private web's life. And that's one of the great things that we do here at the State Library is help people find their family genealogy and make their connection uh, to the past. And so that was just a journey within itself of looking at everything that we can possibly find uh, about Private Web's life. And on our website or on my blog, there is the script of Private Web where you'll see much of the documentation uh, is there. So we wanted to make sure uh, we had the primary documents and using the majority coming from our collection. Uh, that's right here. That's housed in our Connecticut archives. That's housed there in our building. And so that was the historical approach uh, just gleaning and getting all of the information from the primary documents that we can pull uh, from Private Webb's life and his movement uh, with the 29th to be able to put the story together uh, because these guys were moving together as a unit. And so, so excuse you, me, Kevin. So those were those are some letters that you found as well. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, okay. Private Webb did not write any letters himself, uh, but we did find. Uh, writings from Colonel Wooster, 
who was the uh, colonel of the regiment. So we do have that in our collection. And uh, there's some information of some of the guys from the 29th. Actually, three books uh, from the 29th, the Out of the Briar story, the sketch of the 29th, and the story of the 29th. And so we do have those in our collection. So we're able to read those and uh, glean information from those documents and sources there from okay. soldiers who returned home. Thank you. And from our chat room, we have a question that I thought about, and I think it's a real good question to ask. Out of the 26 years uh, that you've been doing this, do you see uh, a difference from your initial understanding of the presentation of uh, Web to what it is today? Have What kind of development have you uh, been able to put into it or have you discovered? Wow. Uh, that's a huge question. It is a huge uh, question. Yeah, because, you know, being new at trying to do and bring this story to life, when I first uh, started presenting, uh, had my script and just began to uh, read that first presentation at the University of Connecticut was just a read through. But the more I began to uh, dive into the historical documents and look at the movement of the regiment and looking at these ordinary men that were in this extraordinary battle, I began to then feel, you know, from many of the officers writing about the 29th and uh, what they were feeling, you know, and how the men were. And so that became more passionate for me, uh, looking at those. And so over the years, uh, definitely tapping into uh, the emotion, uh, the humanity. And so that part I've grown as a presenter uh, because I understand and looking at the period and knowing that they were fighting for this thing called freedom and, and willing to sacrifice their life. And so those emotions and that roller coaster ride that goes with that and uh, just really want to tap into that. And so I've grown as a presenter uh, because there are moments uh, where tears would flow down my eyes uh, just looking at the story and sharing the story. And so uh, from my first presentation to now, uh, definitely a uh, better presenter uh, with the story because I got a good handle on the story. But I try not to also, uh, Brother Andre, is uh, just put on a uniform and present because uh, I don't want to do that because this is their story. So I really try to make sure every time I put the uniform on that I'm carrying that load and burden of what those men were hoping to gain and we're living out that freedom and so you're walking into the door as if your ancestors were walking right behind you kicking the door open even so the next question i had for you had to do with a personal feeling about this because many times we can look at a writing or some um, research and we can see ourselves in it so that would be our text to self kind of a connection. Do you see any of that in uh, your uh, portrayal of uh, Private Web? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I do definitely connect with the story, uh, listening to my own family history uh, from my grandmother and sharing uh, my family history coming from Alabama and going through the uh, my, one of my great great uncles who was a runaway slave and that whole aspect of freedom and uh, the line of, of what this really meant. So I definitely connect uh, with that part of the story of this liberation and then being one who, you know, tries to really encourage our young people to the importance of our story, of the history of the Africans in America. And so uh, it does make a connection for me looking at Private Web's life and the movement uh, within the city. Uh, so those have become real for me. Have any of the... Um portrayals that you've done of Private Web been so connected, you've been so connected to them that they've made you emotional. They, they get, sometimes I get caught, things get caught in my throat. I get stopped and I'm, I'm about to cry or be upset or be emotional. Has that been your, uh, the connection been so close that, that any of that's happened with you? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, there are moments that I, I truly uh, don't know how I'm going to feel. Um, as a presenter, you know, uh, it, it, it's based on the emotion and then the story um, of the 29th and the whole battle of the Civil War, uh, losing lives. And, and so that part really grips me up. So there are days when uh, it comes more alive for me and I don't know how I'm going to respond. Uh, one of the battles I talk about is the battle of the Petersburg Crater 
uh, when guys lost their lives and, and this horrible battle uh, that they lost their lives. And so that for me was um, just a, a uh, emotional period. And to be able to try to convey that, you know, to the audience too, but it hits me. And so there are tears flowing down my eyes unexpectedly. Uh, but yes, definitely uh, get emotional at times uh, and sharing the story. If I was uh, one of your youngest students that you uh, visited at a particular school and I walked up to you and I said, well, who is Private Webb? Could you, in, in a you know simple way, tell me, because I'm a young kid, who is Private Webb? I was a, a gentleman uh, from Hartford uh, who, through his journey of life, has uh, had some, some, some issues. I uh, made some mistakes in life, as you heard me share, uh, went to, to prison um, and served uh, four years of prison time. But also coming out of that journey of uh, an experience of prison, uh, then joined into the Civil War uh, to make a change, you know, not only for himself, but for the country, uh, saving the union, but also the journey of, of the courage and also the, the journey of freedom. Uh, for African Americans, you know, and so that that part of who he is shares a lot with me that we can turn our lives around, you know, and we can do better and do some great things uh, in our lives. And all we have to do is just have the courage and the boldness to be able to step out. And so I think he was very bold. Uh, was one of the few gentlemen in the 29th out of all those gentlemen that were able to uh, read and write. And so I uh, said a lot uh, from looking at the paperwork of his journey. Uh, that, yeah, it was an individual that definitely made some mistakes in life, but also turned them around. And so we can always do better. Uh, so he was human. So he was human, he was, like, the rest yes, of, sir. like the rest of us. Can you talk to me about his family? Uh, and doing the research, great question. Doing the research, uh, started out uh, finding who he was, found his mom. Uh, that was our biographical sketch that we needed to put the vital records together. And so found his mom. and. Not sure uh, where the last name Webb uh, came from. Uh, Connecticut abolished slavery in 1848, but he wasn't listed as a slave. His mom was, uh, but not sure of the owner of the time. And uh, so out of wedlock, not sure how that part came for him, but digging into uh, those vital records and uh, looking at his life and finding his mom and her marriage then to Mr. Salisbury, uh, who was a landowner, uh, in Ellington, Connecticut, and had a property there. Uh, and they got married, and then Private Webb uh, goes into prison into the service. Uh, then he has a sister uh, who actually relocates outside of Boston and marries. And so my search there has pretty much come to an end. The family, uh, mom and stepdad, moves up to Mass with the sister. But then I kind of backed away from continuing because I'm out on the road presenting uh, more than I, anything else. But when I do stop presenting, I'll continue to do the work on finishing up Private Webb's uh, family background and, and his sister and his mom. Any descendants to speak of? Uh, not that we were able to find at this moment. Um, he did marry Augusta E. Madison, uh, who at the time of the research, uh, he was 29, Private Webb. And at the time, we thought she was 11, but that was the wrong document. Uh, but being 14 years old, and as you know, many young people between the women between the 1860s and 1870 uh, period were marrying young, both African, European, and Native American. So when people are looking at their ancestral history, they'll, don't be surprised uh, that your great, great, great grandma may have gotten married very young with permission. And so Private Webb marries Augusta. Uh, she later dies at the age of 19, but they had no children to the union. How is Private Webb, your portrayal of him, received when you go to these schools? And do you find any little black boys who um, relate or get us anything special gifts from you when you go out? Because I know you must look for it, because I know I do when I go out. <laughs> Wow, that, that, that's a great question. Um, as I began presenting more and more and started entering into the schools, uh, there was a school in New Britain, uh, Roosevelt Middle School, and sharing there with 
uh, one of my great friends who have passed away, Ms. Nancy Eberhard, and she would do a, a middle school, eighth grade class. And uh, this was my first moment of realizing the connection. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm up on stage and I'm presenting the story. And, um, and there are kids that are just kind of being kids. And I get to the part of Private Webb's life of his mistakes. And next thing you know, uh, the young guys are, are looking up, you know, and they're watching now and they're paying close attention. And the story now is, is connecting. And I, and I saw that, you know, and I'm looking at the, the young guys and, and the story is connecting. And as I'm going through the uh, rest of the battles and Private Webb's journey in the Civil War, you can see that it's, it's, it's having some relevance uh, to these young guys' lives. And as I'm seeing that connection uh, present, and at the end, um, as Nancy comes over and she shares, she says, now, Kev, those are some young men that just kind of never really pay attention with stuff like this. But the way you presented it, there was a connection there. And that was one of my first moments of realizing that this story really is bigger than me. Uh, and it's it has so much relevance uh, to the different audiences. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, that, that was powerful uh, for me. And so I do look for those moments, even when I'm presenting, uh, who's connecting uh, to the story. And as a presenter, as a performer, uh, that definitely helps uh, bring the energy out uh, even more. So do you find yourself having to be um, this automatic role model, having to become a better person because of uh, the youth that are looking up to you? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's very uh, significant. That's, that's serious um, because we, we, we want to set the example. You know, historically, I, I believe we stand on, on big shoulders of those who have come before us. Uh, that, have, that, that wear the skin. Uh, I still think of Frederick Douglass, who uh, says to those gentlemen from the 29th, you know, when you go into battle or you get into the war, uh, be good men, you know, be men of, of, of respect, uh, be men of honor. And so that charge to them, I thought, was a, a huge charge. And so for me, that was a moment of, of really um, making sure that, that, that I live up to that part, too. Uh, not just put on the period clothing, but be an example, even when I take off the period clothing, of someone that somebody can say, yeah, he, he's a good role model. He, he's a man of integrity. Uh, and so, so that is very important uh, for me there to make sure that I'm, I'm representing uh, what we stand for and, and to be a, a good role model. So that's a great question. Thank you. It's almost like um, being a person of the cloth. You have to become a better person so because people are watching you. And will sometimes you find yourself modeling that behavior. I had to learn that kind of like the hard way because I just started off as a storyteller thinking, I'm just going to tell some stories. But I started getting recognized. So I'm sure you get recognized out in the community. There's that guy who came to <laughs> school, played private web. I want to ask another question. What is the most important takeaway for your journey portraying Webb? And the second part is, is there a moment that has been really quite fulfilling for you? Wow, those are two great questions. Um, the, the, the first is the takeaway. Uh, what is the takeaway? Uh, it's the humanity uh, of the story. Uh, I think when you look at the history of Africans in America and what we've gleaned from oral history, from ancestral history, uh, having you know my own personal family, you know, go through the, the period of slavery and getting the stories from my grandmother, um, that that takeaway of humanity. You know, uh, when you look at the soldier's life, uh, you you, you want to feel the humanity. You know that these are real people, you know, real men uh, fighting for a real cause you know, saving the union, but also liberation uh, for themselves. And so that part is something that I really try to uh, get across uh, the most is the humanity of the soldier. Uh, so there are those moments, you know, within the story of tapping into that uh, emotional period of looking at the battles and seeing, you know, wounded men, uh, men who have lost their lives and the impact that that had on all the soldiers. 
And so to share that humanity and make that come across as a, as a presenter, as a performer, uh, is, is real. Uh, and that's what I want audiences to always connect. So even if they just close their eyes and not necessarily see an African-American soldier, but to see a, a human being, you know, a, a soldier and telling his story uh, of what it was like going through the Civil War. And, so, and then that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I just remember the, 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 the significant uh, question. Um, for me, yeah, this is very significant um, in making sure that we can keep these stories alive, you know, making sure that the message uh, of freedom and liberation and humanity is something that we, we never get old, grow old or tired of hearing. Uh, we want to make uh, ancestral periods, um, you know, human uh, and to share that. So that part is very significant for me. Is that the most, one of the fulfilling things about it, teaching empathy, ethics, compassion, it sounds like, and it doesn't matter what color you are. I mentioned uh, little black boys because you and I are African-American and we know that we're trying to set some sort of a, a role model out there, but it actually doesn't have anything to do. I mean, it doesn't matter what color you are to teach those kinds of lessons. And for me, that was most f f fulfilling. And it sounds like we have that in common to be able to hit the ground running and know that when we leave a place that you know. Yeah, and that, and that's that fulfilling moment, uh, even with those young guys that I shared with from New Britain, uh, from Roosevelt Middle School, that was fulfilling uh, to be able to see them, uh, you know, not paying attention to now paying attention, you know, to being engaged. And so those are fulfilling moments, even going into some of our correctional institutions and sharing with the guys there and having guys come over after and saying, I, I wish I would have listened, you know, and, and took this to heart uh, earlier in my life, you know, but now looking at the turnaround that we can make uh, in our lives. I, I was just out yesterday and visiting uh, my mom and had two guys that actually saw me uh, present in one of the facilities and say, man, you did such a good job. I still remember that story, you know, and so just to be recognized uh, for the work uh, that we do, but also for the lives that we touch. Uh, we just never know uh, how that touches someone live. And to hear that later, uh, that that moved me, that that did something for me, uh, that's very fulfilling. Someone once said that uh, these types of lessons are impacted in a way like it's throwing a stone into a pond. You don't know how deep it's going to go. You really don't know. I have another question from the chat room. Um, can you speak more about Web, uh, Webb's military career? And uh, did did Webb see any military action and perhaps where? Yes, uh, first first battle, uh, 29th fought in, in five battles or skirmishes um, that were very significant for the regiment. Uh, the first one down in Hilton Head as they're there, uh, Bermuda 100, uh, seeing action. And so Private Webb is right in the mix uh, of those battles, uh, learning how to fire the weapon, um, learning, you know, how to be a good soldier doing the drills and training. And so the, the military experience of what every soldier was going through, there's a great book, Heart Attack and Coffee, uh, that talk about soldiers' lives. And so Private Web is definitely in the mix of, of all of that and looking at some of our muster roll papers and our, our movement of the regiment you can see where these guys are moving and fighting and participating, also building and just doing protection guard duty. Uh, so he, he's definitely in the mix and definitely had a role uh, in many of the battles. So you just mentioned a book, Heart Attack and Coffee. Heart Attack. What was it? Heart Attack. Heart Attack. Heart Attack. Heart attack. I want to make sure that that's out there so people can write that down. Hard tack and coffee. And also you said that uh, Webb could read and write, but he didn't write any letters. I found that kind of interesting, too. Yeah. So we, we were searching for that um, to find anything that he may have written, uh, but haven't come up with that yet. Uh, we do have the documentation uh, of his court cases, uh, you know, when he was 
caught on the Connecticut River, uh, you know, stealing a boat. We do have uh, that Connecticut uh, warrant, and so that stuff is there. Uh, but yeah, I was surprised that he didn't leave anything, uh, a letter behind. Uh, we was hoping to find it, uh, but hopefully before I, I, I retire, uh, we can find something uh, that's written about his life. We do have his will uh, in the agency. I was left with $25 in that house that was in Ellington, uh, which is now part of one of the highways uh, that's there, Route 83. And so, um, so yeah, we do have that uh, piece of evidence for him, but nothing by him that's written uh, that we found as of this point. So, Kevin, is there yes. somewhere that you've taken this message, this um, character, this portrayal of um, Private Web that you haven't gone that you'd like to go? Say, say it one more time. Let, let me hear it one more time. Say it one more time. Is there any place that you uh, want to go with this character, with, with uh, Private Web? Is there any place you pre you haven't presented that you'd like to present? You, you mean as far as location? Uh, let's use your map. Location. <laughs> your I mean, Hollywood. Hollywood. Uh, uh, I, I thought one day I'll be able to get a chance to sit with Oprah. Uh, and share the story uh, there. Um, but the biggest moment for me was definitely standing on the stage of Tanglewood uh, in the Berkshires. And uh, that was a huge moment that I would have never, never even imagined uh, from taking that first date and then standing on that historic stage and sharing the story of Private Web. So if, if that was a, a major moment uh, of a place that I would have never imagined uh, presenting along with so many other actors that was there that day, uh, professionals that that just blew my mind uh, to be able to, to stand there and then also to present in New York City. Uh, I haven't gone to Broadway yet, but uh, for a big company out there in the training moment of sharing historical stuff, and um, uh, that was another huge moment. So there are definitely those those places. Um, but definitely Hollywood. Uh, if we can get there uh, and share the story before I take the uniform off, uh, it will be huge. But just the impact, I mean, locally, uh, to be able to do what we do and keep this particular story alive and to make the awareness there. Uh, so I'm really, really grateful for that. Kevin, somebody in the chat room says, William Webb, the musical. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I think you got some writing to do. You can write your own uh, play or you can write your own uh, treatment for a movie. Uh, why not? Why not? What's next for you, my friend? Wow. That, 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 is, that is the question, uh, Brother Andre. That's the question. Where, where do we go from here? And as Ms. Tammy already is aware, uh, one of the things that... Um, working on now is the story of Professor Jim, uh, James Professor Jim Williams, who was the janitor for Trinity College for 50 years and did the research and had the opportunity of presenting his story twice now. And I really have fallen in love with this old aged uh, janitor who has just a an awesome journey, an awesome story. And I'm I'm really excited uh, about sharing his story. And, and so that's my next journey there. I already share uh, Jordan Freeman's story, uh, which is one for me that has really moved me uh, in a unique way uh, because it's the founding of our country. Uh, he's killed at the Battle of Fort Griswold. And his journey you know, starts that, that road to freedom. And so every time I put that uniform on and and die in that particular battle, uh, I play an American hero, you know, so I, I, I stand up. Uh, it is truly an emotional roller coaster uh, for that time period, but definitely one that is needed to be told. That story has to be heard. And so I enjoy sharing Jordan Freeman's story, but I'm really looking forward to Professor Jim, who was a local story uh, in Hartford, uh, Janet at Trinity College, but just has a, a fascinating life. And for me, Brother Andre, it is my presenter, performer, give back uh, to our seniors. Uh, I just believe it is one that um, 
shows the journey of, of those who have lived. Uh, when I think of Professor Jim's story, because he's coming through the late 1700s and uh, dies in 1878, but just this span of what he has witnessed in his life. And we have the a narrative here of one of the graduates from Trinity who actually came back. Uh, and interviewed the old janitor and just put a story down, which I think is used for history. It's what we do in gleaning our own family history. Uh, and I think all of us have a story. So this is my give back to our seniors, because I think I believe our seniors just have so much that they've witnessed and to be able to put those stories, you know, down on paper and, and to share that journey of what it was like, you know, to go from there to there. And so I'm really excited for Professor Jim. You have to check that one out because I do play an 83 year old gentleman. So, uh, so my movement is totally different uh, in that story. I'm not a soldier this time, but he was impressive for the War of 1812. So it does give me an opportunity to speak about that forgotten war. Uh, and share that piece. But I, I'm excited. But that's what's next. And then a couple of years after that, uh, hopefully uh, this young man can uh, take his rest uh, from presenting and from uh, this particular agency and, and call it a day. So are you saying that these um, portrayals that you want to put together are people that you want to do while you're still at the agency or once you're gone? Because it sounds like you're never retiring, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. Uh, now, 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 Professor Jim uh, is definitely one I can continue. Uh, you know, working at the State Library, and one of the, the, the things that we try to do here from the agency perspective is to be able to share with, with our citizens, with our state, you know, with, with, with residents, uh, what we have and the, the great information that's here, that's available, you know, and so these real stories allow us to really tap into Connecticut's great rich history. And so that part, as the agency, uh, want to make sure we get that out there. Will the agency allow me to continue to, to share the story uh, and, and not have the agency tag? I'm not sure, uh, but we'll see. I, I think they may allow me to do that. I don't know. I think I think you might be able to do do that uh, on your own billing. So there's Professor Jim and there's George Freeman. You said Jordan. Yep, Jordan, Jordan Freeman. Freeman. Mm -hmm. I'm just writing this down. So I think it's ironic that the janitor at Trinity was called Professor Jim. That's that's interesting. What was that all about? See, now I can't give it to you. Now you're gonna have to come and hear the story. See, you trying to trap me. Okay, well, you, know, you just you just gotta come back. That's all. You just gotta. Come back. <laughs> I, and so just so you'll know too, uh, my my discharge date uh, for private web, and I, and I hope your schedule will allow. Uh, my discharge date we're looking at here at the agency is uh, June 18th. Uh, will be the discharge date. Uh, for private web, but I will pick it up during special occasions uh, to be able to share. Tammy and I did talk about finding someone to carry the story uh, because this story needs to continue. Uh, private, even if I'm uh, an age janitor now, uh, but the story definitely needs to continue. So we'll definitely find someone uh, who can carry uh, the story of not just private web, but of the 29th. And so, but June 18th was hopefully will be my discharge date for private web that I can pull off the uniform and then put on my Professor Jim uh, uniform. If you give me a second, I'm going to reach out of your screen for one second and show you a picture of okay. how he looks. Okay. All right. I have another question for you too, so go ahead. Is that Professor Jim? This is Professor Jim. He was the janitor? Yeah. He's very well yeah. dressed, my friend. That's a very well dressed. Oh, say that again, Brother Ajay. He's a very well dressed janitor. Yes, sir. Yes, Let sir. me ask you, you should, this question. You, you um, should see my period clothing for that. Oh, we I already pulled it together. Oh, you already pulled it together. Sorry, sorry. I'm getting excited. <laughs> no, okay. Hey, I'm trying to get as much info out of you as possible. <laughs> when you speak of the values of these kinds of presentations as educate, educational resources rather than reading it from a book 
Yes, um, it, it's definitely educational. I always call it edutainment uh, because we educate and we entertain at the same time. But the value of these kind of presentations, it brings it to life. Uh, that's what many of our school teachers have shared with me over the journey, that it, it, it takes the uh, history off of the, the pages and, and brings it to life uh, to where people can you know, feel uh, that they were just real people, you know, caught up in their particular day and time um, and just trying to, to, to survive and to live. And that that journey is real. And so those values, educational values, it's, it's truly important, you know, because sometimes we disconnect uh, from what's on the paper and we just read the story, but we miss the humanity. Uh, and, it, and when you have a, a performer, uh, it, it makes it real uh, for each audience that experiences that performance. It's bringing it to life for real. Yes. And we know that people learn in so many different ways that this is just a great way, an opportunity, if you will, to capture it and present it right in front of somebody in real life. Kevin Johnson, thank you so much for joining us here today on Conversations at noon. Um, I want to thank you and everyone else for joining us today. And before we wrap up, I want to tell everybody about our up and coming programs. Um, we have on Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024 at 12 o'clock, bringing the Freedom Trail to life for real by somebody that, oh, yours truly, Andre K. Wow. <laughs> I forgot I was going to be reading that. And then on Tuesday, May 28th, 2024, at noon again, a conversation with Dr. Orisad Awadwola. Dr. Orisad Awadwola. On Tuesday, June 25th, 2024, at noon in person at Connecticut's Old State House. That's really significant. That will be in person, a conversation on the Newton family. Dolly Marshall and John Mills, another African-American brother who is out here doing great things. But until that time, everybody, thank you again for joining us today at Conversation at Noon. Kevin, thank you so much for coming in and doing the wonderful job you did portraying Private, uh, private um, what's his name? William Webb. William Webb. William Webb, his whole yeah. name. <laughs> Private William Webb for us today and letting us know, giving us a little sneak preview of what we have to see coming up in the future. We don't look forward to you stepping down, but we do look forward to you bringing forth new portrayals. Until next time, everybody, take care and peace. <laughs>